Welcome to um, the second lecture in this series on high entropy alloys organized by Professor Chakrabarti. Uh, and um, I'll begin where I stopped at the last lecture, which is um, I introduced the term uh, stability. So, you know, I explained that configurational entropy has huge consequences by giving you examples of uh, diffusion through the solid state and also why the strength of uh, materials collapse when the size increases because you know the configurational entropy says there will be defects and there's nothing you can do about that so if entropy is dominant is the dominant contribution to free energy then it becomes feasible to stabilize a multi-component solution but we need to think a little bit more about this term stabilize because it isn't really reasonable to talk about stability of a single phase. It's always the case that you have to consider stability with respect to another phase. It doesn't make sense to talk about the stability of a single phase. And that, of course, is illustrated uh, by this uh, simple um, diagram, which you are all used to because we plot phase diagrams. We are plotting free energy versus chemical composition uh, in a binary system. Uh, I'm assuming here uh, the free energy of this uh, high entropy alloy, but it could be any phase. And this is another phase. Let's call it sigma. Uh, sigma is usually an intermetallic compound, uh, and I'll come back to that later. But you can see that when we consider stability with respect to another phase, uh, there will be single phase regions, but also a two phase region. So we need to think about stability and talk about stability by considering what other phase we are referring to. So always talk about stability with respect to something else. In this case, it's the sigma phase. And just to show you, you know, the the most researched high entropy alloys are the ones containing, you know, chromium, iron, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And uh, they do form as uh, single phase uh, materials after solidification and with a reasonable cooling rate to ambient temperature. So here, for example, whoops, um, here, for example, is the uh, Cantor alloy, the chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel alloy nice and uh, homogeneous after a homogenization treatment and cooling down to ambient temperature. But if you hold it uh, for a thousand hours at 700 degrees centigrade, then you get the precipitation of this uh, intermetallic compound, which is called sigma. So this alloy is not stable with respect to the precipitation of sigma at 700 degrees centigrade. It might be stable if you go to 1000 degrees centigrade, but at 700 degrees centigrade, you should expect in the long term the precipitation of sigma phase. And of course, this is the classic uh, high entropy alloy, uh, where we have equal amounts of chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. Uh, but there are other variants of this so called Cantor alloy, and the chromium, iron, cobalt, nickel with equal amounts of uh, each of these elements has a lower entropy of mixing because there are four components as opposed to five. And yet, you know, if you anneal this uh, for a thousand hours at 700 degrees centigrade, uh, it remains stable. Okay, so in terms of stability with respect to sigma phase, this is considered to be unstable, and this is considered to be stable, even though this has a lower entropy of mixing. So I think the entropy of mixing is take, should be taken as a rough guide on whether you, know, you will get a, a solid solution, but it doesn't tell you much uh, about stability with respect to another phase, and especially if you're going to use it at a temperature where atoms can diffuse and generally speaking you know uh, as a rough guide above 600 degrees centigrade there is sufficient atomic mobility for 
substitutional elements and therefore you need to think about the stability with respect to the precipitation of other phases. Now the other issue is um, you know we are assuming an ideal entropy of mixing that means that the atoms are distributed at random. Now there is a technique to study whether or not the atoms are distributed at random and that's the uh, field ion microscope and atom probe and I'm going to show you uh, uh, so the field ion microscope and atom probe can see individual atoms in the structure and also chemically identify them so we can do atom by atom analysis and of course if we do atom by atom analysis then when a chromium atom reaches your time of flight mass spectrometer you'll detect hundred percent chromium and when a manganese atom reaches it's hundred percent manganese so so it's not possible to decide whether the alloy is homogeneous or not just by looking at the concentrations reaching your uh, your time of flight mass spectrometer so supposing we look at 50 ion clusters right uh, and uh, work out the average composition of those 50 ion clusters uh, this is a, a particular alloy system which contains iron and chromium and we get variation in composition as illustrated uh, average taken over 50 iron clusters so remember there is no error in the chemical analysis here uh, you know each atom is analyzed using the time of flight mass spectrometer and is uniquely identified so uh, the normal question that I ask when I show this is can we consider this to be a chemically homogeneous system with a random distribution of iron and chromium atoms and it's very difficult to say because we obviously have a variation in composition but is that variation different from if you took 50 iron clusters from a completely random solution so that is the real question to ask is that if I have a completely random solution and I collect 50 ion clusters then will I get something like this and the only way to answer that is to compare the distribution of uh, compositions that we detect here with a binomial distribution so here for example uh, the black refers to the atom probe analysis and the white to the binomial and you can see that you know we basically get uh, uh, agreement with a random distribution of atoms because this material is produced by mechanical alloying so the atoms are forced into solution uh, as somebody mentioned uh, in the last lecture and of course iron chromium system is the classic system where you get spinodal decomposition at around uh, 475 degrees centigrade so it should not be a random solution and indeed you can repeat this experiment uh, after holding it at a, a, a temperature within the spinodal for a long enough time and you will see separation into chromium rich and iron rich regions okay so the way to decide whether or not the atoms are distributed at random uh, is to compare the um, chemical composition of small clusters of atoms against what you would expect from a binomial distribution and this work has been done in the case of uh, a high entropy alloy uh, this is the cobalt chromium iron nickel system and uh, we're looking at 100 iron clusters in this case and the comparison uh, of the experimental data which are the black points against the binomial distribution is really very good for this alloy which we decided was stable uh, after holding at a thousand hours uh, for uh, 700 degrees centigrade for a thousand hours now when you do this analysis uh, using the atom probe uh, of course it refers to a particular condition in which you produce the alloy so you produced it and you've uh, allowed it to cool to room temperature and as you'll see later, you know, um, if you just examine it after production, uh, then you may have cooled uh, ra rapidly enough to stop anything from happening. So ideally, 
what we should also do is produce the same results uh, by annealing at a variety of temperatures and again looking at this distribution of atoms. So it is likely that in most high entropy alloys the structure is frozen once you get below about 0 0.8 of the melting temperature and therefore what you're looking at for ambient temperature applications may be okay to assume that you have a random distribution of atoms but not if you are proposing to use the alloy at any temperature around 600 degrees centigrade or higher for long periods of time because then there is sufficient atomic mobility for phase separation or for precipitation if, if that is possible from a thermodynamic point of view. Okay, now uh, we have mentioned repeatedly that we are assuming that there is no enthalpy of mixing or the enthalpy of mixing is uh, close to zero and there is only one solid solution uh, that I discovered after talking to Nirupam Chakrabarti uh, which has a zero enthalpy of mixing and that's the praseodymium and neodymium uh, alloy system they both have their hexagonal structure both have the same number of valence electrons, roughly the same uh, atomic radius and the same electronegativity. So when you make mixtures of praseodymium and neodymium, uh, these are different mixtures, uh, the heat of solution remains constant. Okay? And what that means is that the enthalpy of mixing is zero. So these are experimental measurements of the heat of solution of one of these in the other. So this is a very rare example of what would be an ideal solution at equilibrium. All right. The previous data that I showed you, I emphasized that um, this may not be at equilibrium because the same experiment needs to be done after holding at 700 degrees centigrade for a very long time. Okay. So we are unlikely to get solutions where the enthalpy of mixing is zero. Almost no alloys with enthalpy of mixing equal to zero. And we are assuming uh, when we calculate the entropy of mixing uh, that we have a random mixture of atoms and that obviously is a contradiction. All right. Uh, so, you know, the ideal solution is where delta HM is zero. The regular solution is where Delta HM is not zero, but we still uh, used uh, the ideal entropy of mixing. But it's possible using thermodynamics to actually allow for a finite entropy of mixing and a non-ideal entropy of mixing. And um, I gave a set of le lectures at IIT Kharagpur, which are on my YouTube channel, which discusses the quasi-chemical uh, model, where we have a finite entropy of mixing and uh, a non-ideal entropy of mixing and therefore I'm not going to go into any detail but just to show you the outcome in a binary case uh, omega here is a reflection of the change in bond energy when we break an A bond and a BB bond and create two AB bonds in other words this determines your entropy of mixing and uh, this is a parameter which is a function of uh, enthalpy of mixing. When enthalpy of mixing is zero here, uh, the number of AA bonds and number of AB bonds is simply given by probabilities. So the number of AB bonds will be proportional to the chance of finding an A atom multiplied by the chance of finding a B atom and multiplied by two because we can have AB and BA bonds. And the number of AA bonds would simply be x squared, number of BB bonds would be 1 minus x squared. So that uh, corresponds to these po two points on this diagram. Soon as the enthalpy of mixing uh, becomes negative, that means you are favoring unlike atoms to be close to each other, uh, we get a larger proportion of AB bonds. Okay, it's no longer a random uh, solution, it's, it's more like an ordered solution. And when the enthalpy of mixing is positive, you know, unlike atoms prefer not to be next to each other. So we get a, a dramatic reduction in AB bonds.
So it's possible to calculate a non-ideal entropy of mixing. The case I've illustrated here is for binary, but um, the quasi-chemical models can be of many levels of approximation, so you can handle you know, multi-component systems and higher order interactions and all the rest of it. And you have to decide whether this is worth, worth doing. So, uh, in general, you know, the uh, ideal entropy of mixing that we calculate, the contribution of the ideal entropy of mixing to the free energy of mixing will be larger than what it really is because the atoms will not be distributed at random unless you are dealing with a non-equilibrium structure of the solid solution which has cooled from a high temperature, cooled rapidly from a high temperature. So we are looking now into uh, design rules for high entropy alloys and one, uh, and you know, these have their ori origins uh, in um, like the hume rothery rules and so forth, where if the atomic misfit is large then you tend to get uh, a precipitation rather than a, a solid solution. So um, the way that the atomic radius is calculated is say you have a particular radius for a, a particular atom and another radius for another atom in your solution, you take the average of those two and R bar is the mean radius here and this is for a particular atom uh, element in your solution. and you scale that by the concentration of that element. So this is a measure of the misfit in the solid solution. And the Cantor alloys that uh, I illustrated earlier have very little misfit, you know, because chromium, iron, and manganese, and so forth, have very similar atomic radii. And uh, there is a really interesting piece of work done by uh, Nick Jones and Howard Stone, where they compared the level of lattice strain, that means not a homogeneous strain, you know we all know that when we add uh, a solute to a solvent the lattice parameter increases but that's that's not uh, that's not an heterogeneous strain, it's a homogeneous strain where the lattice parameter expands but you know locally around misfitting atoms you also have strains and those are heterogeneous strains and there are techniques to measure those strains. And they demonstrated experimentally that in the Cantor alloys, which uh, I showed earlier, the level of strain is so small, the local strain around atoms is so small, heterogeneous strain is so small that you can't distinguish it, for example, from pure nickel. Okay, So that doesn't really play a part in the Cantor type alloys, but Many of the other alloys, for example, when uh, we make the refractory high entropy alloys and so on, are likely to have much larger uh, lattice strains due to misfit. And this is the ratio of the contribution to the free energy of mixing from the entropy of mixing, ideal entropy of mixing, and the enthalpy of mixing. And you know, when it's one, these are similar, and of course, when this is large, that means the entropy of mixing makes a huge contribution and these data show you solutions tend to be uh, tend to occur when the misfit is small and when the contribution from the entropy of mixing is overwhelming okay so this uh, this can be taken as a general rule when you're thinking of designing your uh, high entropy alloys that you want the enthalpy of mixing to be small and you want the atomic misfit also to be small. We then need to think about you know what is the crystal structure that we should expect from uh, mixing these elements together because ideally we want a nice cubic crystal structure, uh, preferably the FCC form, uh, whereas the constituents of your high entropy alloy will have many different structures. So for example Iron uh, is body-centered cubic at room temperature, uh, chromium is also body-centered cubic, uh, nickel is face-centered cubic, cobalt is uh, hexagonal, and manganese has a unit cell with some 56 atoms in it, so it's a complex, uh, complicated, more complicated structure. 
But nevertheless, you know, when you make a high entropy alloy with equiatomic uh, amounts of all of these elements, it ends up as FCC, which is, uh, you know, something to worry about or, or to think about. Why, why does that happen? Okay. Now, Hume Rothery uh, thought about these things uh, quite a lot uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and that's uh, how the Hume Rothery rules came about. But even before that, you know, people were looking at ionic compounds, you know, for example, sodium chloride here. And, you know, sodium has an electronic, uh, sodium atom has an uh, electron structure, which is like a neon atom plus one electron in this uh, 3s uh, um, state. And chlorine, uh, so this is obviously an incomplete shell because you need, uh, you need uh, two. So this is what we call a valence electron. Yeah, it, can, it can be shared between atoms. And on the other hand, uh, chlorine has, has a gap in its uh, p orbitals because uh, this is not six. So what happens is that you transfer one sodium uh, electron to the chlorine uh, that makes a complete p shell and you have an ionic bond there. So the idea of valency being important came long before, you know, we even started thinking of uh, metals, uh, you know, Pauling and so forth and many other people uh, could work out, you know, that uh, you would need so many atoms of this and so many atoms of that to form uh, a compound. But this is a very clear system, you know, ionic compounds and ionic bonding is, a, is, is not at all complicated when we compare with metallic bonds. A metallic bond has a lot of electrons delocalized over a large number of atoms in close proximity. And the important thing is that you need a large number of atoms uh, before you get the delocalization. And when we talk about transition metals, it gets even a bit more complicated than that because uh, there is, a, you know, if I, if I go back to the previous slide, um, these shells here have a lower energy than this one, okay? The electrons in these shells have a lower energy than this one. But in the case of the transition metals, there is actually an overlap of energy between, for example, the 3D and 4S bands. So even though 4S should be a higher energy level than the 3D in your ionic uh, compound, uh, it's not the case in the case uh, for, for metallic uh, elements. So you can imagine that the electrons spend a fraction of their time in the 3D bands and a fraction of their time in the 4S bands. So the total number of valency electrons for ion atoms is eight. So um, we need to think about large differences in the number of valency electrons between the elements because if there are large differences, then according to the empirical hume rothery rules, you will not tend to get a solid solution. Okay, And uh, just to distinguish between a solution and a compound, a solution is something where you can get solubility over a large range of compositions. Whereas a compound also has flexibility in its composition, but it's a very narrow flexibility because the free energy increases rapidly as you deviate from some sort of a, a, a stoichiometric composition. So compounds, according to the empirical rules uh, of Hume Rothery, um, they initiate when the valence, to ele valence electron to atom ratio exceeds a certain critical uh, value. Uh, so, so when we mix uh, metals with different valencies, you know, the electron to atom ratio will change as a function of concentration until it reaches some particular value where, you know, you trigger another phase. And the classic system that Hume Rothery considered, he actually looked at very many systems uh, and, and, you know, his rules actually work for a large number of systems. So this is the copper zinc system where we have this alpha brass, which is FCC and uh, beta prime, um, which is uh, primitive cubic. Uh, 
at a higher temperature, uh, the beta prime is disordered and therefore it becomes body centered cubic. But this is what we call primitive cubic because this site in the center of the cube is not equivalent to the site at the corner. So there's actually a pair of atoms that you place at each lattice point of a primitive cube corner. So you can't call this body centered cubic. It's actually a primitive cubic lattice. So uh, according to the Hume Rothery rule, uh, he discovered that you know when the electron atom ratio exceeds 1.38, you begin to get the precipitation of uh, your beta prime phase. And in his time, you know, it was thought that uh, the this particular electron to atom ratio corresponds to the point where the where the um, uh, energy levels of the electrons touch uh, a boundary, a Bruen zone boundary. Later on that was shown not to be the case. Okay, So we regard these rules as empirical but they work a lot of the time. And here for example uh, are people using the hume rothery rules uh, of um, electron to atom ratio and these are the, the valency electrons. Uh, so you remember I told you that iron has eight, okay, 7.8 plus two shared between the uh, uh, two different energy levels. So these are, uh, this is a tabulation of um, the number of uh, electrons, valency electrons per atom that I've taken from this paper here. And then you plot, you know, what solution you get as a function of the electron to atom ratio in in the case of uh, high entropy alloys and indeed you get the sharp transitions okay so these are not rigorous rules it will not always work but it works some of the time so it uh, you know i mean none of the theory that we use for example phase diagram calculations work all the time because the, uh, we, there's a lot of extrapolation involved from binary and ternary systems to calculate higher order um, phase diagrams. So I'm not bothered about the fact that this doesn't always work. It works quite a lot of the time and it's something that you can use when you're thinking of creating a high entropy alloy. It may or may not be correct but it will give you some guidance on how to approach the problem. And it's a very simple calculation to do. Now, this is another uh, plot um, where we have the enthalpy of mixing here and the percentage of misfit that uh, I explained uh, earlier in an earlier diagram. And this is for uh, this, uh, all this data referred to all of these elements uh, in, in five or six component uh, high entropy alloys and the argument was that you know uh, at this point we only get FCC and at this point we only get BCC but look there's an awful lot of confusion here okay where we get both FCC and BCC so I personally don't think this is a good way of deciding whether you're going to get FCC or BCC or both. So I took all of these data, okay, and remember all of these data, that there's an awful lot of points here, and I did a very simple analysis where I focused just on the iron, nickel, aluminium concentrations and completely ignored everything else, okay, even though there might be equal amount of chromium in and cobalt in this high entropy alloy, I'm completely ignoring all these and just looking at iron, nickel and aluminium and to my astonishment and remember I included all of these points. When I plot against the aluminium to nickel plus iron ratio there is an absolutely clear distinction between the FCC and BCC. Now the number of points here looks less than in the previous slide and that's because there's an awful lot of overlap of points uh, according to this. Now why did I why did I decide to plot against aluminium divided by nickel plus iron? Well that's a simple metallurgist thinking that you know when we add nickel to iron we stabilize the FCC phase but 
you recall that the aluminium phase diagram uh, is quite dramatic in showing that it stabilizes the ferrite phase beyond a certain concentration. So it makes sense to me that if I add aluminium to a high entropy alloy, it will tend to become a body centered cubic structure. Okay? And that turns out to be the case for this very large number of uh, uh, high entropy alloys which contain all of these elements, and I'm completely ignoring this. Okay? So you could use this in, in, uh, when you're talking about a combination of these elements to see whether you end up with FCC or BCC. It's such a simple calculation. Now, of course, uh, you know, in preparing these lectures, uh, I find some anomalies, such as, such as uh, this overlap region. And this seems to indicate something important, that I can ignore the other elements. And this work is not complete, but I asked, um, uh, I asked uh, Aparao Chinta in uh, Tata Steel to calculate uh, a ternary phase diagram section, where we have just um, aluminium here, nickel, and of course we can work out the iron concentration as the difference between the uh, 100 minus um, nickel and aluminium. And when we plot the same data, okay, and I've only plotted a few of those data, uh, and this is for uh, 800 degrees centigrade, this section, ignoring all the other elements, all right, only focusing on iron, nickel, and al aluminium. Once again, you know, the BCC ones uh, found experimentally fall in the ferrite region and the FCC in the austenite region. So the next calculations that he's going to do is to introduce uh, other elements. So we have the uh, aluminium, iron and nickel already in this diagram. Now supposing I add chromium, why, why doesn't the structure actually look different? Okay, so we want to find out using just plain thermodynamics why we are getting these crystal structures okay and at what temperature should we calculate the isothermal section of the phase diagram so that everything falls into place because obviously these isothermal sections change with temperature so very simple analysis now another design method that you can use for high entropy alloys is machine learning uh, I'm not going to talk about machine learning today, but I am extremely interested in one particular paper in which the parameters which were used in order to implement the machine learning, in other words, the inputs in machine learning, are really interesting. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the parameters because you can calculate them by yourself without actually having a machine learning model. So. This is, uh, this is uh, again, for ambient conditions. In other words, we are not looking at uh, stability at high temperatures. And in general, if you want to homogenize a high entropy alloy, you should do it at, zero point, uh, at the temperature, which is 0 0.8 of the melting temperature. Okay, And then cool sufficiently rapidly uh, and that's not a very high cooling rate, but I mean, don't dwell at intermediate temperatures for a very long time because the structure essentially then can be considered to be frozen below about 0 0.8 TM. Now this equation looks very complicated, but actually it isn't. So um, let's have any number of components in our high entropy alloy, but we will only look at binary combinations of all those alloys. So for example, this might be iron, this might be nickel, uh, and this is the melting temperature of an iron-nickel combination for the concentrations of iron and nickel in our high entropy alloy, multiplied by the concentration of iron and concentration of nickel, and then divided by the concentration of iron and the concentration of nickel, and we do this summation over all possible binary combinations however number of components we have in our, our high entropy alloy, 
this calculation is done for the entire binary combinations. So iron nickel, iron cobalt, iron chromium, iron whatever, and then cobalt nickel, cobalt iron, etc., etc. And then that gives us the overall melting temperature of the high entropy alloy. And this is a really, really important parameter to know when designing a high entropy alloy because it determines whether you can homogenize it, for example, or whether you can use it uh, for elevated temperatures and so on. So I'm going to go through this calculation just to illustrate to you. Uh, now, there are very few actual measurements of the melting temperature of high entropy alloys, but I found one in the literature, so I'm going to do the calculation for that particular case. Uh, so, uh, it's about this uh, famous equiat. Uh, well, this one contains copper actually, so it's not uh, the normal Cantor alloy, but it's chromium, manganese, iron, copper, nickel. So, I looked up the binary phase diagrams. And uh, of course, this contains equiatomic, so there's 20 atomic percent of copper and 20 atomic percent of nickel. But we do the calculation of the binary. Uh, we find the melting temperature of the binary when these are in equal amounts, so 50-50. And that gives me the melting temperature for the copper-nickel combination. Similarly, uh, we have uh, 20 atomic percent of manganese and iron. In other words, the ratio is half and half. Uh, a ratio is um, bo both of these uh, on a phase diagram we would look at the 50 percent and this would be the melting temperature of the iron manganese combination okay so here I've got the two melting temperatures here and these are the actual concentration so that complicated equation that you saw earlier is simply I take the 1620 multiply by the concentrations of iron and manganese add the melting temperature of copper nickel multiplied by um, concentrations of copper and nickel and then divide by the sum of the products of these two and I get an overall melting temperature of 1625 but I have to do this for all possible combinations of the binaries like copper nickel iron manganese and so on and so on so I went through the process and uh, these are all the different combinations uh, and the different binary melting temperatures assuming that we have 50% chromium 50% iron and this is the product of the concentrations and this uh, is the term that goes into the summation and I calculated uh, a temperature of 1393 degrees centigrade which is in such good agreement with the measurement done using uh, differential scanning calorimetry of 1400 degrees centigrade now, you should not expect an exact agreement anyway. Uh, you know, this is just a 7 degree C difference uh, because, you know, an alloy will actually melt over a range of temperatures and we are looking now at the liquidus temperature only when we talk about the melting temperature, okay? But I think this is a very, very nice way of calculating the melting temperature. Uh, I don't have a theoretical justification for doing this. But what we are doing effectively is empirically using data from binary alloys to work out a melting temperature for any number of components in your sample. Now, some people use a much simpler method. Um, and um, this, has, uh, this doesn't have any proof that this works that the overall melting temperature is simply the individual melting temperatures multi uh, scaled by the concentration of the element. No evidence whatsoever that this works because these calculations are done without comparing against an experimental measurement. So this is, for, this is a refractory uh, high entropy alloy and the calculated um, melting temperature is 2946 Kelvin. But wouldn't it be simple to do a measurement using differential scanning calorimetry or some other method? Um, the, the equation here is established because the machine learning model in which this was an input, um, you know, the input is calculated and put into your machine learning model, is able 
to actually make predictions to something like 90% accuracy. Okay, so uh, in the same uh, machine learning method, um, they wanted to estimate the single phase field fraction for a multi-component alloy. So they designed another parameter where they took again the binaries and you know the single phase extends between A and B and between C and D so you define these parameters that the alpha single phase field is AB divided by AD and the gamma phase field is CD divided by AD and then you feed it into exactly the same form of equation as the melting temperature that you've calculated the alpha single phase field uh, let's say for iron and manganese and these are the concentrations of iron and manganese in your multi-component alloy and then you divide by those concentrations and you do this summation for every binary combination so iron manganese iron chromium iron cobalt and so forth and so on and that gives you a parameter which says look uh, you know i have a good chance or a bad chance of get, hitting a single phase field of alpha in my multi-component system depending on the magnitude of this parameter here similarly they looked at phase separation where now we are actually looking at the tendency for phase separation by looking at this distance here bc divided by ad and the tendency for mixing is of course uh, the remainder which is this segment and this segment and those were also inputs into the machine learning so with a phase diagram like this uh, there would be very little chance of getting mixing but a very high chance of getting phase separation but with a phase diagram like this you might have a reasonable chance of getting uh, mixing happening and you know binary phase diagrams are available for almost anything you can imagine and therefore this is a good way of extrapolating to multi-component systems and uh, they defined uh, the um, a parameter to compare separation that means precipitation uh, against mixing like this in the machine learning model so these calculations you can do by hand you don't need the uh, i mean if you have access to the machine learning model that's even better but uh, i think these are instructive actually it makes you think about what is important in designing the um, high entropy alloy okay let's now look at first principles calculations so first principles calculations basically uh, ele involve electron theory and uh, because uh, we often don't have data um, first principles calculations don't need experimental data you can say okay uh, i can imagine an fecr2 compound now what would be the enthalpy change accompanying the formation of uh, that compound uh, and i can then try and see whether it is a very large enthalpy change in which case uh, i will get that precipitation or not uh, now compounds are very easy with first principles calculation because there is a, a well-defined chemical composition for the compound because first principles methods are not very uh, it's not really possible to handle solutions where you have a wide range of composition because that means that your supercell that you use in the calculations has to be so big that you basically don't have comp computational power so uh, the condition for compound formation uh, in this particular paper was that uh, you know the enthalpy of mixing should be uh, small to avoid phase separation and uh, you know for that compound to form it should be small relative to um, this uh, parameter because everything gets frozen at about 0 0.8 of the melting temperature for alloys that are made in the laboratory now they did these calculations for a large number of compounds I'm only showing you a, a few uh, extracted a few from there and uh, you know this would be obviously zero 
at the end, uh, delta H uh, because it's chromium and chromium. But chromium with manganese has a large um, entropy of formation, negative uh, entropy of formation, and, and so on. So the idea is that uh, you know you you should select elements uh, which uh, have a low, small number, okay. Uh, and on this basis, they predicted that this canter alloys uh, really should be stable um, to the formation of ordered binary compounds. Okay. Now, obviously, you know uh, we are we are stretching our imagination a bit because the compounds themselves will not be binary but nevertheless you know this is a kind of a guide there are problems okay uh, so the calculations are for binary compounds and they have to assume stoichiometry whereas you know if you look at sigma phase or lavas phase they are actually multi-component compounds and of course, uh, you know, many of these uh, papers on first principles calculations don't emphasize that the calculations are done for zero Kelvin and zero pressure. Uh, somebody in yesterday's lecture asked about the heat capacity due to lattice vibrations. And this is a measured uh, curve for the heat capacity of a particular high entropy alloy. Heat capacity at constant volume. And it follows, uh, so this is uh, due to lattice vibrations, okay? And in, in a metallic structure, you know, uh, initially the lattice vibrations have to be coupled, okay? So the heat capacity is uh, really quite small at low temperatures uh, until, you know, um, the vibrations become effectively like a gas, uh, in which case this heat capacity is uh, three times uh, K Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number. Uh, so here, uh, beyond the divide temperature, it's behaving as if it's uh, it's a it's a gas effectively. Okay, so it follows the classical behavior. Now, why am I mentioning heat capacity here? Where, whereas we are talking about first principles calculations, but why does the heat capacity change, uh, and how does that affect the enthalpy? Well, enthalpy changes can be calculated as a function of temperature by integrating the heat capacity versus the temperature. Yes, it's a classical thermodynamics. So if you calculate an enthalpy term for zero Kelvin, it doesn't mean that it applies at a higher temperature. And uh, I, I demonstrated this in the case uh, of cementite. Where, you know, if you do a first principles calculation for enthalpy at zero Kelvin, zero pressure, it obviously is not the same as doing it uh, as a measured value at a high temperature. Okay. Uh, so you have to set uh, criteria uh, which are empirical on where where you would accept that compound formation is avoided or not avoided. But that's okay. You know, as long as we have a good empirical guide guide to doing this so in today's lecture uh, I have uh, explained some of the design criteria and we covered thermodynamics we covered uh, empirical hume rothery rules you know where we look at misfit and electron to atom ratios and so on uh, and uh, we looked at um, first principles calculations and machine learning. So in all of these, uh, they are not perfect. But, you know, no modeling is perfect. But you can use it as a guide to narrow down your experiments. Okay, so that's all for today. And uh, in the final lecture tomorrow, I'll focus uh, also on how to make these alloys. You know processing which is very important and the difficulties involved in processing okay so i'll stop there and uh, um, stop sharing my screen so that we can uh, see each other and i'll be happy to answer questions we have uh, like yesterday we have 20 minutes for questions and answers um, can i ask you a question please Yes, of course. Hello. Yeah. Uh, what uh, you were uh, 
mentioning about the machine learning and uh, the way you have demonstrated the melting temperature and other parameter. Uh, and also you were showing that uh, kind of melting temperature by other group they do, which looks like a rule up mixture. Mm -hmm. So do you try that rule up mixture with how far it is different from that TM, the way it has been calculated by machine learning? Has, did yeah. you look at it? So um, unfortunately, they have not measured Okay, so that's the big problem is that uh, uh, they've used that parameter, uh, the rule of mixtures, but not actually uh, done a measurement. So it is impossible to say whether it works. But if you wanted to test that, uh, it would be very easy because you look at some phase diagrams and see whether, well, I mean, you're not likely to have a five component phase diagram. But I think you would need to have a measurement to say whether this is reasonable or not. Now, the melting temperature that I calculated for a particular high entropy alloy was done by hand, but using the parameter that they use in machine learning. So what impressed me is the parameters that they used to create their machine learning model, rather than the actual, uh, I mean, uh, the machine learning model is good, but that isn't what I was focusing on. Yeah, I, I was asking, do, so the question is slightly different, that through machine learning, you could show that predicted temperature is just a seven degree difference. My point was that uh, applying the rule of mixture, what was the melting temperature coming out? Well, they haven't measured it, so I can't... Um... No, not measured. The oh, I see. Oh, for the same, for the same. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Rule of mixture of the individual element anyway it is more. Okay, okay. All right. So, so, so I will do that uh, later on and show you tomorrow. Okay. okay. Thank you. I okay. hope it should uh, give some light. Okay. Okay. That's a very, very good uh, point. Yeah. So there's a, a question on the chat which says uh, the Hume-Rose rule about the uh, electron to atom ratio. Um, what is the basis for the vacancy uh, electron concentration? Uh, it's completely empirical. Okay. Uh, there, there is uh, there is no fundamental basis. Um, it is empirical, but by intuition you would expect. Uh, you would expect that if there is a large difference in the valencies, then there might be a tendency for precipitation. So there is no fundamental basis uh, for that. And uh, second uh, question is, uh, can you comment on the use of the MIDEMA calculations for enthalpy of mixing for binary solutions? Uh, so for binary solutions, uh, you don't actually need to use uh, anything like that because there's an awful lot of uh, thermodynamic data available. But again, it's an approximation. The Midema uh, method is an approximation to calculate the enthalpies of mixing. Hello, Professor. Yep. Uh, professor, uh, regarding the descriptors for the machine learning model that you have used, uh, it, they are empirical mostly. Uh, it has been, are they really empirical? Is it like hit and trial? I uh, looked at the original papers. Uh, I looked at the original papers and also tried to think on why why it should work. And the original papers simply state the parameters. They give no justification for for it. And I cannot see any uh, justification for multiplying a melting temperature by the two concentrations taken in the ratio rather than the um, actual concentrations and so on. So I spent some time on this and I could not find a theoretical justification for those forms. But I was Professor, impressed that it, it worked. Professor, is it like a weighted average? It seems to be something like a weighted average of uh, the melting temperature. Yes, it's, uh, it's like a nonlinear weighted average. Thank you, Professor. Now, there's a question which says, uh, how long should it take to um, anneal to look at uh, the stability? 
so I will discuss that in the next lecture because you know we have to think about diffusion in these alloys to homogenize and and other other factors and another question saying for transition metals valency electron to atom ratio has been pointed as a negative value rather than electrons in the outer shell i don't actually un understand uh, understand that uh, maybe you can comment on that can I uh, elaborate that question? Yes, please. Yeah. See, uh, when uh, transition metal like iron, cobalt, and nickel, many of the intermetallics, people have found out that iron actually accepts the electron rather than donates the electron in the electron clouds. So therefore, uh, it has been that is a Rainer, GV Rainer, and all in their paper, mm -hmm. they have discussed that uh, actually there is some negative value. For example, iron is minus 2.66, cobalt is minus 1.66, nickel is around minus 0.67. So oh. there is a so there is a kind of this thing because they don't donate, they accept. That's why the negative value has been uh, signed and they have found out through uh, experiments. So the problem comes in iron entropy alloy literature. People take all the electrons of the outer cell, D, S, and all, whatever, then they say valence electron. So what I wanted to know, what is your view and what do you think that uh, how it can be sorted out mm. and which one should be the right step? I honestly don't know is the, is the real answer. I haven't come across a negative uh, electron to atom ratio, but I will, I will think about it. Um, at the moment, I don't yeah. An answer. Sure. Right. You pointed out that uh, kind of stability of the phase from the Hume Rothery based on balance electron. I thought Hume Rothery, that uh, zone zones, the Brillouin zone and zone interaction, hmm. that gives a reasonable idea of the physics. No. no? Um, in fact, what because that in the copper thing they have calculated that what should be the Brillouin zone structure. Yeah. And uh, how that Brillouin zone you can calculate and Fermi surface and Brillouin zone they should touch or interact. And yeah. based on that, they calculated that what should be the structure which can accommodate that kind of that number of electrons. Yeah, so, so, so everything uh, everything was going in the right direction until Pippard in, in Cambridge. He actually did measurements of the Fermi surface relative to the Brillouin zone and showed that even in pure copper, you know, it touches the uh, Fermi surface, touches the Brillouin zone. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the basis uh, for the particular electron to atom ratio causing, uh, uh, causing a change because the Fermi surface touched the Brillouin zone disappeared. Uh, and then Mott and Jones uh, did their classic work on metallic bonding. So, unfortunately, we have to think about the hume rothery rules as empirical for that reason. Still, it is in the textbook we accept that uh, the physics partly uh, is explained by Brillouin zone and uh, this zone interaction. Hmm. I think many of the textbooks still they talk about. I know, but it's uh, wrong. Uh, okay. uh, I mean, uh, Hume Rothery himself uh, accepted yeah. that, yeah? Yeah. So if you yeah. look at uh, his um, biography and so on, and, and of course it's, uh, it's now a well-known story uh, but that Pippard actually measured the Fermi surface and it was already touching the Brillouin zone in pure copper. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, so, um, so there are some interesting questions. Uh, for example, uh, you know, addition of rare earths, uh, high entropy alloys. I have no idea what that would do, but it's something for someone to explore. Uh, and um, will electropulsing do something to high entropy alloys? Again, you know, electropulsing is an interesting idea. Uh, it has no theoretical basis at the moment. Uh, but there are some spectacular structural changes which have been demonstrated by electropulsing 
steels and aluminum alloys and so forth. So you could study that if you, if you wanted to, but both electropulsing and uh, um, the changes caused by electropulsing have no theoretical basis at the moment. So it's, it's, in, it's a very interesting area to work on, but to discover actually the mechanisms rather than just do electropulsing and see what happens. Uh, someone is asking about interstitial high entropy alloys, which will appear in the next lecture. Okay, so it's very good that you're all anticipating what will come in the last lecture. Okay, so we have now uh, run out of time. Thank you all for attending and uh, hopefully see you tomorrow.